senior pastor of St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, the Reverend Eric Benson Thomas. Reverend Thomas. God bless you, Reverend McKinstry. Thank you for our devotion moment this morning and uh, this afternoon, rather, this evening. And thank you for that scripture. That's one of my favorite scriptures right there. So I, that, that worked out and encouraged me as well. Um, if somebody got a phone line over there, I think, Rev. Okay. And so we're glad to be here tonight. We're gl grateful again for all of those of you who are willing to jump on here every night. Um, I talked to Sister Veronica Banks today. And Sister Veronica Banks says she has not missed a night. And it's interesting. I was um, I was um, scrolling through my notes, and I was missing some days. I think I, those those notes didn't um, didn't they, I don't know they're somewhere around here. But I said I said well, and I was wondering well, how am I gonna find those things? But Sister Banks has been faithful every night and has been uh, taking notes uh, all the time. So I'm gonna give her a call soon when I put my notes together and I'll read over those notes. So I'm grateful for participation. Uh -huh. All of you all have been diligent and, dil and and just committed to the word of God. I know without a doubt that being committed to the word of God pays off, period. I think we all want to say as a reminder for somebody who may have, may have forgotten that this 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 tasting and seeing that the Lord is good will bless our lives in so many ways that we would not be able to count them. And so I'm grateful for all of you all that's on the phone line and the Zoom line. We're going to continue tonight in the book of Habakkuk, and I'm going to do this tonight. Uh, chapter 2 has been a... A, a chapter, which all, all the prophetic books have a very tough chapter, but it's, it is actually a chapter that is responding. I want to be clear, responding to, you know, in other words, in this chapter, Habakkuk uh, asked a question in chapter one. God now is responding to his query in regards to the use of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians um, for punishment of God's people. Now, here's what Habakkuk, the Lord showed me this today. Here's what Habakkuk's concern was. Habakkuk's concern was that as God used the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, they were sometimes known and later known to punish God's people. Um, his concern was that the Babylonians then would 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 reign. He was he was concerned about their being they being in charge and running the earth, the world and taking over everything and just being in charge. And he was just concerned about how that would play itself out. In other words, he, I, I, he was saying, God, if you know, okay, you, you, you I, I, we need punishment, we need discipline. Why are you going to use these people? Because if they get victory over us, they're going to think they, they run everything. They're going to think they're in charge of everything. I'm going to tell you this funny story um, that happened, uh, shoot, Isaiah 21 night, 11 years ago. And he was at the park, and uh, it was about three little girls up there that just kind of followed him around. And so one of the girls came to me, and at the park, I was still, that's where the whole PT came from. So a little girl came to me and said, PT, um, can you talk to so and so? I said, okay. I said, about what? She said, um, everybody already like her, and if Isaiah start like her, she gonna think she better than everybody. She gonna be hard to control. And I laughed hysterically because it was funny that somebody was following my son around. But it was funny because she felt like this girl had enough, and if she got the upper hand in this little category right here, she was just gonna boss everybody around. Guess what? That's the same concern Rebecca was having. Rebecca said, listen, if 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 God, if they get the upper hand on us, they already defeated um, the Egyptians. They already defeated the Assyrians. If they get the upper hand on us, you know they got they got think everybody. They gonna run everybody. And it's with that question in mind, that God um, responded in chapter two, because as we've seen, each of these each of these little clauses that we see in chapter two um, correspond with God saying whoa. In other words, God is saying whoa or punishment be. The first thing in chapter two, verse six. Um, after he established to um, um, Habakkuk that he had it under control, God didn't just say, Habakkuk, don't worry about it. I got it under control. God says, let me tell you. Let me tell you what I what I know as an omnipotent God and omniscient God and omnipresent God. Let me tell you what I know as a sovereign God so you can rest assured that ain't nobody going to get, get, get slipped past me. In chapter 2, verse 6, God brings about the reality of, that the selfishness and the success um, of, 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 of the Chaldeans would be their downfall. In other words, they were so selfish. Now, listen to this. They were so selfish, and their success would kill them. In other words, here's the thing, and, and some of you all in line know this better, it, know this well. When you're successful, your responsibility is not to hoard your success. Your responsibility is to share it. And, and if you don't, it can become a hindrance to you. Do y'all know people who, who, just, who just want everything and just hoard it? Are covetous and hoarders of everything. There was a show called Hoarders, and the person that was guy they had a really nice house, but he destroyed the house with hoarding. He destroyed it by just keeping everything he ever kept it, and, and, and because of that, 
he destroyed the home. He destroyed his life was just a turn upside down. That's what can happen when we are when people are so covetousness of everything that they can't share anything, any blessing that God has given them any. And I'm not just talking about tangible stuff. They just want to, they want to just be on top and keep everybody down. God told Rebecca, I see the selfishness of the of the Chaldeans. And their success as it retains to Israel, the, uh, the northern kingdom, is going to be their downfall. The next thing God moves on to say, not only will their success be a problem, but God says their willingness to be cunning uh, in, in bad ways. Verses 9 through 10, we talked about that last night. Uh, I read it to you. God says, Woe to him that covenants an evil covenant to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and sinned against thy soul. God says, they so tricky. They just, they want to, their strategies are so numerous that they always want to, you know, want to, want to, want to manhandle somebody through a slick way, a slickness of, of, of lifestyle. That's what the, the Chaldeans were known for. And God says that is going to be their undoing because I see their cunningness and their cunningness is wrong. And again, every time God said, whoa, about the Chaldeans, God was also pointing this out to the people of Israel. It's no need for you all to be selfish. There's no need to be you all be cunning uh, because you belong to me. And I'm in church today. Don't be selfish. If God's giving you a gift, use it. Use it. Don't worry about somebody giving you something for you. Use your gift so that you'll be blessed by God because you gave away what he gave you to give. Likewise, no reason to be cunning. No reason to try to outslick somebody. That's a hard habit for some of us to break. And I'll be honest with you. Uh, when I was a younger man, that was a trick. That was tricky because you, you, you could convince people stuff. But eventually you grow to the point where you understand, hey, let me just be honest. Let me just tell the truth. Let me just put on the table. And that's what God is telling the people of God to do today. Just be honest with each other. That's how we can work better together. He's saying the Chaldeans' capacity to be cunning was wrong. And then God says, I'll punish them for that. On um, verses 12 through 14, and, and this is what we are picking up at tonight. Let me read verses 12 through 14. This is the third woe that God is saying. In other words, almost like God is saying, they'll be cursed because they're selfish. They'll be cursed because they're cunningness. Verse 12 through 14 says this. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall wear themselves for their vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth now let me let me let me slow down on this because this is very important god says to to habeka woe to him and he's talking about the chaldeans initially but also in that same verse in the same clause god speaks to the world woe to him woe to the people that build this a town with blood that have used violence as their methodology to control things one of the things this revealed to me is that even as i former president, um, rallied the nation, or rallied people, not the nation, but people to come and, and kidnap people and kill people. He'll pay for that. And also those people who fought pay for that as well. It is never, and, and this is what the verse says, uh, woe to him to build it and establish iniquity. By doing wrong, by breaking laws, by doing that which is not just a civil law, but that is offensive to God. It is never a part of God's work in our lives that we are violent and try to get power by violence. It's never part of God's will working our lives that we do wrong to get over. And then verse 13 says it very clearly. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people should verify. God says, I don't want you all, people, nobody, to work in the labor and the verify. What's the verify? The very area of punishment. God said, I don't want you to work in the area of punishment and establish a city by iniquity. God said, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for you to achieve those things. God said, that's not my will. And so if somebody says, you know, God wants us to get folk back, that's not true. Well, God wants us to get up hand, that's not true. That's not true. That's not how God operates. And so God tells Habakkuk, listen, I, I'm watching the Chaldeans, and I know that's what they are, and they're going to pay for it. But likewise, God is telling Habakkuk, take this message, as he said in chapter, um, chapter 2, take this message back to the people of Israel so that they will be aware as well, that I don't play that. That's what God is saying in verses 20. So he starts off by talking about greed. He moves on selfishness. He moves on talking about cunningness. And now he's talking about bloodshed and injustice. And that is not a way to attain um, attain any type of, 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 of success. And now as I look out and see, um, I'm trying not to say so-called Christians, but I'm going to say it. These people who claim to be great Christians that want to take away rights of other people that don't look like them or don't act like them and have them. That's not Christianity in the fall, Karen Acton. 
but I know definitively that is if God is going to do it, how he, he may use he may use protests, he may use corporate um um um, um punishment. He may use corporations to put it out. I also can't put it out. But what I do know is the righteousness just does not stand because God is a what? He's a righteous God. And so for those who are who are uh, who are moving by iniquity, moving by the capacity to put other people down. God says it's not going to work. And he says, I see that that's another reason. When he says, whoa, he's like, that's another reason that I'm going to destroy the Chaldeans. Look at verse um, 15. Um, no, let me look at the end of verse 14. The, the verse says this, for the earth shall be filled. Look at this. With the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. God says the reason why Habakkuk and the reason why St. Peter, that I'm not, in, I'm not concerned about this because I know what's going to happen. God says at the, at, in the end that the world, not just America, not just Europe, not just Africa, Australia, Antarctica, the world, everybody will see and know the the the, the very that we be filled with the knowledge of the Lord and the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. In other words, the same way that the oceans, if you get on a ship and take out across the Atlantic Ocean, it may be weeks or months before you see um another piece of land so the earth is more is covered by water it's covered and there's water everywhere and so god says just as surely as the world the, the, the waters cover the sea that's what it is. all the sea is covered in water period god said that's the same way that the coverage of his of knowledge of him and glory will will come to pass he says behold uh, he says for the earth shall be filled he doesn't say when and this is what i know is happening right now it's not a date that necessary. God says the world will know. The whole earth will know. The earth will know. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. The knowledge of the glory of God. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord. In other words, at some point, the whole world. Well, I think Paul said it best in, in, in Philippians. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. At that moment, if the Buddhists will have to declare Jesus is Lord. The Hindu, the Muslim. Everybody will have to stand up and then bow down when they see Jesus coming and the world will be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's what he told Rebecca, and that's what God is telling us today. The world will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. What's his glory? That's his weight. That's his presence. That's his power. That's this light that shines as a result of who he is. And so here's what God is saying to Rebecca in regards. Don't worry about what you see because the time is coming when my glory will fill the earth. So everybody who was deceitful, dishonest, um, greedy, selfish, all those people were paid because my glory will fill the earth. The people who him realize they at the very bottom. And the people who 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 trust the Lord and believe the Lord will be will, will, will bask in his glory as a result of his coming. That that's 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 what the message I think that that Habakkuk all to tell Israel, Israel, listen, let's not try to be like everybody else. Let's let us know we're serving the true and living God. The message for the church today is, hey, Christians, hey, Christians, believers, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, do not try to be like the world to get ahead, but follow in the ways of God that God may elevate you in due season, as First Peter says, but also because we know that the day will come when the fullness of the knowledge of the glory of God will come to pass, and that day we will rejoice in the Lord. We can rejoice now, however, knowing that that day is coming. We can rejoice now in the knowledge that God's power is reigning right now, but it will become plain to everybody at that moment that God reveals the, his full knowledge of his glory, that we will be, again, shouting hallelujah while others are being cast into eternal torment in damnation in hell, separated from God. And so Paul, uh, uh, Habakkuk, God is telling Habakkuk to tell Israel that so Israel will live right. God is telling us that day so we'll live in complete faith and trust in him. That we will, as, as the risen, vision has been written here in Habakkuk, that we will run and read it and we will know that it's going to come to pass. We won't worry about the timing, but we'll know that it's going to come to pass. That's what this, this chapter um, elevates for us as well. Now, in verse 15, he continues. He says, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink and put a stop bottle to him and maketh him drunk and also that I may us look on, on their nakedness. So let me let me tell a story about the book of, in, the, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, one of the issues that took place with Noah was Noah got drunk and, and he was humiliated before his family as a result of his behavior when he was drunk. So what God is saying here about the Chaldeans in the book of Habakkuk is that Habakkuk was a people, uh, was a, a nation of people who lied they did not come in house 
see, they would come with drinks, not to make people comfortable. They come, you know, with what they would come with drinks to so people would humiliate themselves because that was their way of putting people down. It still happens today quite a bit. People go out of their way to embarrass people, to humiliate people, to, 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 to gain up a hand on people. And, and, and God is saying, again, he watches, he sees, he understands it, he knows that. And so he's saying that that person um, will, will be punished as a result of, his, of, of, of let's, let's look at this, reaching out with the hand of hospitality and instead of shaking a hand, pushing somebody to humiliate them. That, that, that's, what, that's what God is saying. And God is saying, hey, uh, Habakkuk, I see the Chaldeans do this. I see they take over a nation, and instead of being hospitable, I see them trying to humiliate folk. That's what God is saying about Habakkuk. Now, in verse uh, 16, God says in, in, in response, those people are filled with shame glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned to thee, and shameful spew shall be on thy glory. God says that the way they treat the people, they're going to be embarrassed themselves. So think about that. Everybody who tries to embarrass somebody, God says, I'm going to embarrass them. I'm going to reveal them for who they really are. Uh, I always find it fascinating the people um, that in Congress, for example, they go out of their way to cut down people and talk about people. It's almost, it's almost like you can set your clock to it. It's just a matter of time before they get humiliated. The guy that they're having such a difficult time with that now, Matt Gates, he was the hardest talking, put everybody down. It was so hateful and full of self. That, but the, now look what happened. He can't. He can't avoid the news. He can't even go to the to the mailbox anymore. What God is saying that He's going to punish those who live a lifestyle to put others down, and not just in time, but in eternity. So, in other words, some of the punishment may come now, but ultimately the punishment will be totally complete. As God is telling Habakkuk, I see what the Chaldeans are doing. Don't worry about it. I'm 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 I'm, I'm sovereign. Um, Habakkuk, I see them. I'll let you know that I know who they are. I'm just telling you, I know who they are and understand they will get punished as well. Verse 17, God says, For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beach which made speech which made them afraid because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land and of the city and of all that dwell therein. He says, this, what, Look at this. What profit is the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and the teacher of lies that the make of his work trusted therein to make them idols. So let me let me talk about this for a moment. Um, in addition to God disorienting those who have sought to disorient others, to disconnect others, God lets them know, lets Habakkuk know, they will experience the violence and, and they will be overrun and they will be destroyed. But in verse 18, God says this. Here's his, here's his, here's his, here's his castigation is indictment upon the idolaters. So God's talking about the greedy, the violent, the drunk, and the slick. And now he's talking about the idolaters. Let me talk about this. I'm going to take my time to this one. The idolaters are those who, as he described here in verse 18, who make images themselves and then teach that the image that they made said something and then trusted the image that they made. In other words, God is saying that there are people who trust things that they made. And in, in, in our world today, maybe they didn't make it, but then maybe they bought it. Maybe they maybe they made it their their God, their, their idolaters. Idolaters is somebody who says, oh, yeah, I hear God, but I'm going to trust my money. Or I hear God, but I'm going to trust my stuff. I hear God, you know, the storm coming, I'm going to trust my house to protect me. I, I'm going to trust trust myself. I'm going to trust what I have, have put together, this, 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 um, this, this, this what I've collected with my own hands, this empire that I built with my own hands, God is saying to them, there's no profit in that. There's no benefit in that because ultimately everything that you make with your hands or you bought with your money is, is, is dead because it cannot live. Let me just read it again. He said, and teach of lies. Some people, and I'm not talking about necessarily the body on here, but think about it. Some people are so dependent upon stuff that they lose their stuff that they will be feel like they, 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 they something happened. I talked to my day that said, Oh, I lost my phone. I'm just going to die. And I thought that was interesting. I like to keep my phone on because I got a lot of stuff in there, a lot of notes and scriptures. But if I lose it, I know God will provide it for me again, and he'll provide me a phone again. But some people put so much stuff into material things that they are totally disconnected from God because they think that thing, whatever that thing is, um, is more important to them than God who gave them the ability to have that thing. God, God told Rebecca in verse 19, war to him that said to the wood, awake till the dumb stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver. And look what he says at the end of verse 18, 19, there's no breath at all in the midst of it. God's saying, curse is the person 
Really, he's saying Shaddam is the person that said to the wood, wake up. Why did God say that? Because some people in, in doing during the time, the Chaldean time, they worship stuff, wood stuff they built their hands, and they worship um um images that were made of wood but covered in gold. They worshiped those things. They made those things paramount in their lives. And God said it's ridiculous because what, what it is that you made can't breathe. It can't breathe. It doesn't have breath. How would something dead benefit you who are alive? That's that's what he's asking. How could your car be a blessing to you? Because your car will run out of gas. It ain't got no breath in it. How can money be, how can money be an eternal blessing for you? How can it be a blessing to you? And this is why so many people get caught up. And so many people don't have because we focus more on the stuff than the giver of whatever, I, the giver of every good and perfect gift. But God closed this, 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 this theme out with Habakkuk. Here's what he says in verse 19. But the Lord, even though there's idolaters, even though there's people who are, who are, 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 are greedy, even though there are people who are selfish and cunning, even though there are people um, who are, who are um, um, idolaters, all these people, God, don't worry about that at all, Habakkuk. You shouldn't worry either. Why, God? God says, but the Lord, God says, I am in my holy temple. That's where I am. God says, yeah, you can go by the, 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 the Buddhist God, but he's still stuck there. And he can't go nowhere. And he can't breathe life. Our God is in his holy temple. Where is that? Everywhere. All of heaven is occupied by God. And the whole earth is occupied by the presence of God. But the Lord is in his holy temple. that all the earth keeps out before him. God says, listen, and I want us to think about this for a second worry and wonder about what's going on in the world, let us recognize this, that God it is his holy temple. Um, let me see if I can put it like this. When I was a child, uh, I used to go out to play with the most confident thing about me going out in my neighborhood, uh, cousin Phyllis, to play was that knowing that when I got home, mom and dad were there. I, I, I could have fun because I knew they were there. They were there. They were, everything was all right. God is telling us on a larger scale, we ain't got to worry about nothing. We ain't got to worry about nobody because God is where he needs to be. He is in control of everything. He got everything under his authority. And so there's no reason for us to, to, to worry. And the whole earth shall keep silent for him. What does that mean? That means all who trust him are silent because we know he's going to take care of us. And all those who don't trust him are silent because they realize they made a mistake. Let all the earth keep silent for him because of his greatness and because of his majesty and because of his power and because of his goodness. That cannot defeat us. We can defeat ourselves and then it runs at us. But as we trust God, who is in his holy temple, what we'll find out is the enemy cannot reach us to beat us. The enemy cannot destroy us. The enemy cannot get the best of us. The enemy cannot get up a hand on us because we're serving a God who is in his holy temple. And that means he sits high. And I'm going to go old school on y'all. But he does what? He looks low. I'm going to close tonight. But as we go into chapter three, we're going we're gonna to be in a whole different place. Chapter two was a, 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 a verse full of God's um, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging to Habakkuk his, his omniscience. In chapter three, we're going to see um, uh, Habakkuk uh, grab hold to it, cling to it, and we're going to see him in a different man. And I want us to have this concept as well. There's nothing out there that God isn't aware of, nothing. Nothing out there that God doesn't have control over. Nothing out there that God doesn't have jurisdiction over. And with, with that knowledge, we should pr proceed in our lives with a level of boldness and a level of expectation and a level of anticipation that propels us into more and more trust and faith in God, propels us to more and more praise and worship of God. I'll stop tonight at 729. I got out just in time. But I look forward to seeing y'all tomorrow night as we go to chapter 3. And we fully enjoy ourselves in our next class. We go chapter three and we'll fully enjoy ourselves. Let us pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just say thank you for this night. We thank you for the grace and the mercy that you show and continue to show through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank you, Lord, for tonight, for all those who are on this line, for all those, Lord, who are who signed in on the phone line and the Zoom line. And I pray, God, you just bless us for, your, for just bless everybody for their willingness to, to, to study your word. Lord, let, let peace come as a result of the study of your word. Let joy come as a result of the study of your word. Lord, let us have patience and long suffering and meekness and, and, and let us be able to fab, fab, forbear one another in love as we continue your word. God, let that, that joy break out and peace break out in our lives because of your word. I pray God you bless every household, every family, and every um, believer that is on these lines tonight. And then God, I pray that you let your word again get in our hands and our feet that we can serve you. Let your word get in our mind.
mind so we can think about you. Let your word get in our hearts so we can be strengthened by your word. Let your word get in our ears so that that's our soundtrack, the goodness of your word in our ears. And then, God, because we got in our hearts, because we're serving you, because we're trusting you, because we're thinking about you, Lord, let your word get in our, our mouths, tongues, vocal cords, lungs, and throat, that we can declare your word at all times to the world at all times to each other and all times to ourselves. And let us not just be able to, let us in fact do it for your glory, for our satisfaction and for the edification of those you sent us to serve. God, we should do love you and thank you. It is in Jesus' name, amen. Hold on, Zoom. God bless your phone line. Let me